Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. We initiate today's program with the Qiraat, the recitation from the Holy Quran by Brother Ashraf Muhammadi. A'uzu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Allah la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyul qayyum la ta'khuzuhu sinatun wa la nawm lahu ma fi as-samawati wa ma fi al-ard man dhalladhi yashfa'u indahu illa bi'idhni يعلم ما بين أيديهم وما خلفهم ولا يحيطون بشيء من علمه إلا بما شاء وسع كرسيه السماوات والأرض ولا يعوده حفظهما وهو العلي العزيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل يا أهل الكتاب تعالوا إلى كلمة سباء بيننا وبينكم ألا نعبد إلا الله ولا نشرك به شيئا ولا يتخذ بعضنا بعضا أربابا من دون الله فإن تولوا فقولوا اشهدوا بأن مسلمون صدق الله العظيم translation from Surah Al-Baqarah chapter 2 verse 255 I seek refuge with Allah from Satan the accursed in the name of Allah most gracious most merciful Allah there is no God but he the living the self-subsisting eternal no slumber can seize him nor sleep and on earth. Who is there can intercede in his presence except as he permits? He knows what appears to his creatures as before or after or behind him. Nor shall they come past out of his knowledge except as he wills. His throne does extend over the heavens and the earth and he feels no fatigue in the guarding and preserving them for he is the most high the supreme in glory in the name of Allah most gracious most merciful say O people of the book come to common terms as between us and you that we worship none but Allah that we associate no partners with him that we erect not from among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah if then they turn back, say, bear witness that we at least are Muslims bowing to the will of Allah. Verily, Allah has spoken the truth. Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum. May peace be on you. On behalf of the Islamic Research Foundation, I, Dr. Muhammad Naik, welcome all of you to today's program. As did I, you may too have read two days back in the sacred space of the Times of India, Mumbai, the following verses, and I quote, Hold fast all together to God's rope and be not divided among yourselves. Remember with gratitude 
God's favor on you, for you were enemies, and he joined your hearts in love, so that by his grace you became brethren. Let there arise out of you one community, inviting to all that is good, enjoining what is right, and forbidding what is wrong. Holy Quran, Surah Ali Imran, chapter 3, verses 103 and 104. This quotation aptly represents the Islamic Research Foundation's striving for Islamic Dawah, the proper presentation, understanding and clarification of the message of Islam amongst Muslim and non-Muslims, as well as removing misconceptions about Islam amongst Muslims and non-Muslims. Reason, logic and modern scientific understanding are the basis of all our presentations. The IRF office complex has a video cassette library, a publication department, a cable and satellite television production studio, an audio video recording department, and a computer department. It also has a multi purpose audiovisual reading room, an auditorium, a sales outlet called Islamic Dimensions, a ladies' wing, and a children's wing. These provide the much needed facilities and services for understanding the overall excellence of Islam and its proper teachings. The IRF office complex and its facilities are open from 10 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. daily except Fridays. The regular programs of the IRF include organizing public lectures followed by open question and answer sessions like this one today, symposia, open forum interactions and other such programs providing more than 3,500 video cassette titles on Islam and comparative religion to the public on free hire. Pre-distribution of more than 50 publications on Islam on request. Distribution of the Holy Quran with translation for understanding the message of God meant for the whole of humankind. Regular interactions internationally on the internet for presenting the proper message of Islam as well as removing misconceptions about Islam. The IRF also has its own website for providing information and clarifications about Islam. Through the cable TV relay networks in Mumbai alone, the IRF video cassettes on Islam reach more than one million homes daily for approximately three hours. The ATN satellite TV channel telecasts IRF programs on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 6 to 6.30 a.m. Indian Standard Time across 68 countries of the world. The NEPC satellite TV channel and other TV channels to telecast IRF programs regularly. Dr. Zakir Naik, though a medical doctor by professional training, has devoted himself for analyzing Islam and other religions objectively, to understand and spread the real truth understanding and clarifications about religion as a way of life. He is an international orator on Islam and comparative religion. In fact, in the last one year itself, in addition to his many talks in India, Dr. Zakir has delivered more than 160 public talks abroad in the United States of America, Canada, the United Kingdom, South Africa, Singapore, Malaysia, Saudi Arabia, Sri Lanka, and Bahrain. He will inshallah leave next weekend for a series of public talks in Kuwait. He is acclaimed widely for his logical, reasonable, and scientific approach towards this subject. He is appreciated for his comparative knowledge of Hinduism, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, especially for his verbatim quotations from religious scriptures. Concept of God in major religions. Why have we chosen this topic? We not only need to understand and realize what God is and what are his qualities, but also, and it is very important, we need to know what God certainly is not. Brothers and sisters, to promote better understanding and integration on similarities between religions as well as living in real harmony along with the differences, 
the Islamic Research Foundation presents today's talk on Concept of God in Major Religions by Dr. Zakir Naik. Auz billahi min ash-shaytani rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbi shuhali sadri. Wa yasirli amri. Wahlul ughdata min lisani yafkahu kawli. Respected elders and my dear brothers and sisters. I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May peace, blessings and mercy of Almighty God be on all of you. The non-Muslim may be wondering that what was I murmuring or uttering in the beginning of my talk? I was not trying to mesmerize you or hypnotize you, but I was reciting few verses of the Holy Quran from Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 25 and 28. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God, asked Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, to deliver the message to the Pharaoh, Moses, peace be upon him, he prays to Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and recites these verses, Rabbish Rahali Sadri. O oh my Lord, expand my breast for me, expand my center for me. Why are silly amri? And make my task easy for me. Wahlul ugdata millesani. And remove the impediment from my speech. Since we know that Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, was a stammerer, was a stutterer. So he prays to Almighty God to remove the stammering, to loosen his tongue, as well as remove the barriers, if there is any, between him and the person to whom he is going to deliver the message. If a person is giving a talk on other religions, those people in the audience who do not belong to that religion, they may think that this person is going to speak against their religion. For example, if suppose a Hindu is giving a talk on other religions. The non-Hindus may feel that he is going to speak against my religion. If a Christian is giving a talk on other religions, the non-Christians may feel that he is going to speak against my religion. Similarly, I being a Muslim, when I am giving a talk on other religions, the non-Muslims may feel that I am going to speak against their religion. That's the reason. I'm praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God, to loosen my tongue as well as remove the impediment, the barrier, mental or otherwise, if there is any between me and you. The topic of this morning's talk is concept of God in major religions. Religion, according to the Oxford Dictionary, means a belief in a superhuman controlling power, especially a personal God or gods that deserve obedience and worship. The Qari, Pradashraf Muhammadi, he recited two words of the Holy Quran from Surah Al Imran, chapter number three, verse number 64, which says, Kul ya ahl al kitab. Here the people of the book. Ta'alo ila kalmatin sawa'in bainana bainakum. That come to come in terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'abuda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi shayyam. That we associate the partners with him. Wala yatsakhiza ba'aduna ba'adan arbaban minnun illah. That we erect not among ourselves. Lords and patrons other than Allah. Fa'in tawallahu. If then they turn back. Fa'kullu shadu. Say we bear witness. We are now Muslimun, that we are Muslims bowing our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a verse of the Holy Quran, which shows you a way how to speak with people of different communities. It says, Ta'alo ila kalmitim sawa'in, bainana bainakum. That come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'udha illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi shayyam. That we associate to partners with him. 
one thing common in all the major religions of the world is that the God they worship, they believe he is the same God for them as well as for the others. For example, the God which the Hindus worship, they believe he is the same God for the Hindus as well as for the non-Hindus. The God which the Christians worship, they believe he is the same God for the Christians as well as for the non-Christians. Similarly, the God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which we Muslims worship, we believe he is the same Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the Muslims as well as for the non-Muslims. The major religions of the world can be broadly classified as Semitic religions and non-Semitic religions. The non-Semitic religions are further divided into Aryan and non-Aryan religions. The Semitic religions are those religions that are followed by the Semites. Who are the Semites? The Semites are the descendant of Shem, who was the son of Prophet Noah, peace be upon him, which is mentioned in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, chapter number 5 to chapter number 11. The so Semitic religions are those religions that are followed by the Jews, by the Arabs, by the Assyrians, by the Phoenicians, who speak Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic, Akkadian, Phoenician, etc. The major amongst the Semitic religions are Judaism, Christianity and Islam, all of which are prophetic religions. The non-Semitic religions are further divided into Aryan and non-Aryan religions. The Aryan religions are the religions followed by the Aryans, a group of Indo-European speaking community which spread in Iran and northern India in the first half of the second millennium BC, that's 2000 to 1500 BC. The Aryan religion is further divided into Vedic and non-Vedic religions. The Vedic religion is Brahmanism, which has been given the misnomer of Hinduism. The non-Vedic religions are Sikhism, Buddhism, Jainism, etc. Amongst the non-Aryan religions, we have those of the Chinese origin, like Taoism, Confucianism, etc. Those of the Japanese origin, like Shintoism, etc. But most of these religions, they do not have a concept of God. Therefore, they are preferably called as ethical systems instead of religion. As far as my talk today will be concerned, I will be speaking about the concept of God in major religion of Semitic and Aryan origin. To understand the concept of God, the best and the most accurate way is to analyze their religious scriptures and understand what it has to speak about God. Trying to analyze the concept of God by looking at the followers is not always correct because most of the followers, they themselves do not know what the scripture speaks about God. So let's analyze today the concept of God in major religions by analyzing their religious scriptures. First we'll discuss the Aryan religion. Hinduism is the most popular of all the Aryan religions. And if you ask a common Hindu that how many gods does he believe in? Some may say three, some may say thirty-three, some may say a thousand, while the others may say thirty-three crores, three hundred and thirty million. 
But if you ask a Hindu learned man who knows his religious scriptures, he will tell you that the Hindu should actually believe only in one God. The major difference between the common Hindu and the Muslim is that the common Hindu believes in a philosophy known as pantheism. That is, everything is God. The tree is God, the sun is God, the moon is God, the snake is God, the monkey is God, the human beings are God. The Muslim believes that everything is God's, G-O-D with apostrophe S. Everything belongs to God. The tree belongs to God, the sun belongs to God, the moon belongs to God, the snake belongs to God, the monkey belongs to God, the human beings belong to God. So the major difference between the common Hindu and the Muslim is the apostrophe S. The Hindus say everything is God and the Muslims say everything is God, G-O-D with apostrophe S. If we can solve this difference of apostrophe S, the Hindus and the Muslims will be united. How do you do it? As the Quran says, Ta'ala ila qalmitin sawa'i, That comes to come in terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'abuda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala nushika bihi shayyau. That we associate to partners with Him. So let's analyze the concept of God in Hinduism by analyzing their religious scriptures. The most popular amongst all the Hindu religious scriptures is the Bhagavad Gita. This is a copy of Bhagavad Gita in the IRS. We have, alhamdulillah, more than 30 different translations only of Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita says in chapter number 7, verse number 20, that those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desires, they worship the demigod. That means the materialistic people, they worship demigod. That means not the true almighty God. The Upanishads are the other sacred scripture of the Hindus. It's mentioned in the Chandogya Upanishad, chapter number 6. Section number two, verse number one. Ekam evaditiam. God is one only, not a second. That means there's only one God. He doesn't have any partners. He is alone. Same as the Holy Quran, which is mentioned for a class, chapter number 112, verse number one. Ul wallahu ahad. Say he is Allah one and only. It's mentioned in the Smita Svatara Upanishad, chapter number six, verse number nine. Na kasya kasdi janita na kadipa, which means of him there is no parents nor lord. He has got no parents. He has got no masters. That means he alone is sufficient. He is not dependent on anyone else. As the Holy Quran says in Surah Al-Khlas, chapter number 112, verse number three: Lam yalid walam yulad. He begets not, nor is begotten. The quotation I gave from Upanishad was translated by S. Radhakrishnan. And we have other translations also in our foundation. Further, if you read in the Sveta Fatara Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 19, it says, Na tasya pati ma asti. There is no likeness of him. Same as the Holy Quran, Surah Class, chapter number 112. Verse number four. There is nothing like him. It's further mentioned the next verse of the Sveta Fatara Upanishad. Chapter number four, verse number twenty. That his form cannot be seen. No one can see him with the eyes. Similar to the message is given in the Holy Quran, in Surah Anam, chapter number six, verse number 103. No vision can grasp him. But he graspeth all vision. He is beyond comprehension, yet he is acquainted with all things. Amongst all the religious scriptures of the Hindus, the most sacred are the Vedas. And there are principally four Vedas. The Rig Ved, the Ajur Ved, the Sam Ved and the Atharva Ved. The Rig Ved 
deals with songs of praises. The Ajurved deals with sacrificial formulas. The Sam Ved with melody and the Atharva Ved with magical formulas. It's mentioned the Yajurved, chapter number 32, verse number 3. Na tasya patima asti. There is no image of him. And the verse continues and says that he is unborn and he should be worshipped. It mentions Yajurved, chapter number 40, verse number 8, that God is bodiless and pure. It mentions Yajurved, chapter number 40. Verse number 9. Andhatma Pravishanti Ya Sambhuti Apaste. Which means they are entering darkness, those who worship the Asambhuti. The Asambhuti are the natural things like air, water, fire. And the verse continues. They are sinking more in darkness, those who worship the Sambhuti. The Sambhuti are the created things. The quotation I gave of Yajurved was by Devi Chand. as well as by Ras T. Griffith. The other Veda is the Atharva Veda. It's mentioned Atharva Veda, book number 20, chapter number 58, verse number 3. It says, Dev Maha Osi, God is verily great, same as Allah Akbar. Allah is the greatest. Amongst all the Vedas, the most sacred and the oldest is the Rig Veda. It's mentioned in Rig Veda, book number 1, hymn number 154, verse number 46. Sages call one God by many names. That means there are various names given to this one God. And the Rig Veda alone gives no less than 33 different attributes to Almighty God, most of which are mentioned in Rig Veda. Book number two, hymn number one, and one of the beautiful attributes which is mentioned in the Ved of Almighty God is Brahma, which is mentioned in the Ved, book number two, hymn number one, verse number three. Brahma means the creator. If you translate into Arabic, it means Khalik. We Muslims have got no objection if anyone calls Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Khalik or Creator or Brahma. But if someone says that Brahma is Almighty God who has got four heads and on each head is a crown and he has got four arms, we Muslims take strong objection to it. Moreover, it is even prohibited in Yajur Ved. Chapter number 32, verse number 3, which says, Na tasya patima asti, there is no image of him. Another beautiful attribute which is given in the Rig Ved, book number 2, hymn number 1, verse number 3, is Vishnu. Vishnu means the sustainer. If you translate into Arabic, it means Rob. We Muslims, have got no objection if someone calls Almighty God as Rab or Cherisher, Sustainer or Vishnu. But if someone says that Vishnu is Almighty God who has got four hands and one of his right hands holds the chakra that is the discus and one of his left hand holds the conch and he is riding on a bird or reclining on a couch of snake, we Muslims take strong objection to it. We are going against the Ajurved, chapter number 40, verse number 8, which says, God is bodiless, as well as Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 19 of Sweta Swatara Upanishad, which says, Na tasya patima asti, there is no likeness of him. It's mentioned in Rig Ved, book number 8, hymn number 1, verse number 1, Ma Chidangadi Shansata, that means, do not worship anyone besides him alone. Praise him alone. It's mentioned in Rig Ved, book number 5, chapter number 81, verse number 1. It says, 
Verily, great is the glory of the divine creature. Same as Surah Fatiha, chapter number one, verse number two. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the world. It's further mentioned in the Gwed. Book number three, hymn number 34, verse number one. It says that he is the bounteous giver. It's further mentioned in the Ayurved, chapter number 40, verse number 16. It says that lead us to the good path and save us from the sin which makes us wander and go astray. Similar to the verse of the Holy Quran of Surah Fatiha, chapter number 1, verse number 6 and 7, which says, Ihdina Firat al Mustaqim, Firat al Lazina Namta Alayhim, Zayd al Maghdubi Alayhim, Walad Bali. That shows the state path, the path of those who have earned thine favor, and the path of those who go not astray. Let's mention in ways. book number 6, hymn number 45, verse number 16. Ya ik it mushtihi. Praise him who's matchless and alone. The quotation I gave from the Rigved was by Satya Prakash Narayan and Satya Kam Vidyalankar, as well as by Rolf P. Griffith, Volume 1 and Volume 2. We have various translations of religious scriptures of various religions. So whatever quotation you give, if anyone wants to verify that the speaker is pulling a fast one, they are most welcome to come to a foundation and take a photostat copy. And all this translation which I gave to you is not done by Muslims. It's done by the people who follow that religion as well as by Orientalism. The Brahma Sutra of Hinduism, of the Vedanta, the main creed is Ekkam Braham Dusya Naste, Niya Naste Kinchan. Bhagwan Eki hai, Dusra Nahi hai, Nahi hai, Nahi hai, Zara bhi Nahi hai. There is only one God, not a second one, not at all, not at all, not in the least bit. So if you read the Hindu scriptures, you will understand the concept of God in Hinduism. Let's discuss the concept of God in Sikhism. Sikhism is a non-Semitic, Aryan, non-Vedic religion. Though it has a small following, as compared to the other major religions, it is an offshoot of Hinduism. Sikhism was founded by Guru Nanak Sahib at the end of the 15th century. And it originated from the area of Pakistan and Northwest India, that's Punjab, the land of the Five Rivers. And this religion, which was founded by Guru Nanak Sahib, is religion of ten Gurus. The first one who founded the religion is Guru Nanak Sahib. And the last and the tenth one is Guru Gobinda Sahib. Guru Nanak Sahib was born in a Kshatriya, warrior caste family, but he was very much influenced by the Muslims. Sikh is derived from the word Sifya, which means a disciple or follower. And the sacred book of the Sikhs is Sri Guru Granth Sahib. This is the book, Sri Guru Granth Sahib. And the Sikh has to maintain his five Ks. The first K is the Kesh, the uncut hair which all the Gurus kept. The second is the Kanga, the comb which is used to keep the hair clean. The third is the kala, the metal or the steel bangle used for strength and for self-restraint. The fourth is the kripan, the dagger, which is used for self-defense. And the fifth is the kacha, the long underweight, knee length or underdraws, which is used for agility. 
these 5K also help in identifying any fix. The best definition that any fix can give regarding the concept of Almighty God in Sikhism is quote the Mool Mantra, the fundamental creed of Sikhism, which occurs in the beginning of Sri Guru Granth Sahib. At the beginning. That is, of Sri Guru Granth Sahib, volume number one, chapter number one, verse number one, it's also called as Japuji, Mool Mantra. It says that only one God exists and is called by the true, the creator, the one free from fear and hatred, the immortal, not begotten, self-existent, great and compassionate. Sikhism strictly believes in monotheism and Almighty God in the unmanifest form is called as Ek Omkara and in the manifest form he is called as Omkara and Guru Granth Sahib he gave various attributes to this manifest form of Almighty God Omkara and called it also as Kartar the creator Akal the eternal Satanama the holy one Sahib the Lord Parvad Digar, the cherisher, Rahim, the merciful, Karim, the benevolent. And he also called him as Wahe Guru, one true Lord, one true God. Sikhism, besides believing in monotheism, it is also against Autarvada, the concept of incarnation of God. They are against that God can take human form, can incarnate and they are also against idol worship. Guru Nanak was very much influenced by Sant Kabir. No wonder, if you read the Guru Granth Sahib, several chapters contain many couplets, dohas of Sant Kabir. And one of the famous dohas of Sant Kabir is, Dukh mein sumra na sab karay, sukh mein karay na koya. Jo sukh mein sumra na karay, to dukh kaay hoi. Everyone remembers God during trouble. No one remembers Him during peace and happiness. The one who remembers Him during peace and happiness, why will he have trouble? A similar message given in the Holy Quran. In Surah Al-Zumur, chapter 39, verse number 8, that man, when trouble touches him, he cries out to the Lord and repents to Him. And when the Lord bestows him, from his mercy, the man forgets that he had prayed and cried and he associates rivals to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's discuss the concept of God in Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism is a non-Semitic Aryan, non-Vedic religion which is not associated with Hinduism and it's a prophetic religion. Zoroastrianism is also called as Paltrism and it was founded by Prophet Zoroaster. It's an ancient religion of Persia, about two and a half thousand years old. And the sacred scriptures are the Dasatir and Avesta. The Dasatir can be further divided into Khurda Dasatir or Kalan Dasatir. And the Avesta can be further divided into Kurda Avesta or Kalan Avesta, the Maha Avesta or the Zend Avesta. This is a copy of the Avesta, one of the volumes of Avesta. And there are various other translations of the Avesta present in the Islamic Research Foundation. The Zoroastrian, the Parsis, they call Almighty God as Ahura Mazda. Ahura means the Lord, God. Mazda means wise. Ahura Mazda means the wise Lord or the wise God. And he has been given several attributes and names in the Dasatir. For example, he is the only one. He has no beginning, 
no origin and no end. He has no father, no mother, no wife, no son. He has got no image. He is beyond imagination. There's nothing like him. No vision can see him. He is beyond comprehension. He is closer to you than yourself. There are also other attributes given to Almighty God in the Avesta, the other sacred scripture of the Parsi. It's mentioned Avesta in the Gathas and the Yasnas. He is called as the Creator in Yasna, chapter number 31, verse number 7 and 11. And also in other places, in Yasna, chapter number 44, verse number 7, chapter number 50, verse number 11, chapter number 51, verse number 7. In several places, he is called as the Creator. He is also referred as the mightiest, the greatest. In Yasna, chapter number 33, verse number 11, as well as in chapter number 45, verse number 6. He is referred to as the Beneficent in the Yasna, in chapter number 33, verse number 11, as well as in Yasna, chapter number 48, verse number 3. He is referred to as the Bounteous, no less than seven times only in Yasna, chapter number 43, verse number 4, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, and 15. He is also referred as the Bounteous in other places of Yasna, chapter number 44, verse number 2, chapter number 45, verse number 5, chapter number 46, verse number 9, as well as chapter number 48, verse number 3, he is referred to as Bounteous several times. So if you read the scriptures of the Parsis, you will understand the correct concept of Almighty God in Parsism, in Zoroastrianism. Now let's discuss the Semitic religion. Major Semitic religions are Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. First, we'll discuss about the concept of God in Judaism. It's mentioned in the Old Testament. Moses, peace be upon him, says. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 6, verse number 4, Shama Israelo Adna ila Haino Adna Ikhad. It's a Hebrew quotation which means, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. That means God is one and only. It's further mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 43, verse number 11. I, even I, am Lord. And besides me, there is no Savior. In the book of Isaiah, chapter number 45, verse number 5. I am Lord. And there is none else. And I am God besides me who there is no one. In the book of Isaiah. Chapter number 46. Verse number 9. It says, I am Lord. And there is none else. I am God. And there is nothing like me. It's further mentioned. In the book of Exodus. Chapter number 20. Verse number 3 to 5. It says, that God Almighty says in the scriptures, Thou shalt have no other gods besides me. Thou shalt make unto thee no graven image of any likeness, of anything that is in the heavens above, that is in the earth beneath, and that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord, the God, is a jealous God. The same message is repeated in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 5, verse number 7 to 9, that thou shalt have no other God beside me. Thou shalt not make thee any graven image of any likeness, of anything that is in the heavens above, that is in the earth beneath, and in the water beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord, the God, I'm a jealous God. So if you read the Old Testament, you will understand the concept of God in Judaism. It believes only in one God and is totally against idol worship. Before we discuss the concept of God in Christianity, I would like to make a few points clear. 
Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith to believe in Jesus peace be upon him. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus peace be upon him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God. We believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention, which many modern day Christians do not believe. We believe that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. We believe that he healed those born blind and leper with God's permission. The Christian and the Muslims, we are going together hand in hand. But there are parting of ways. There are many Christians who say that Jesus Christ peace be upon him. He was Almighty God. He himself claimed divinity. In fact, if you read the Bible, there is not a single unequivocal statement in the whole Bible where Jesus peace be upon him himself says that I am God or where he says worship me. I would like to repeat that statement that there is not a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ peace be upon him himself says that I am God or where he says worship me. In fact, if you read the Bible, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 28, Jesus, peace be upon him, said, My father is greater than I. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29, My father is greater than all. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28, I cast out devil with the Spirit of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20, I with the finger of God cast out devil. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just. Because I seek not my will, but the will of thy Father who has sent me. He never claimed divinity. In fact, he came to testify the previous law. And he mentioned, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 17 to verse number 20. Think not that I am come to destroy the law and the prophet. I am come not to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till the heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall not pass away from the law until all be fulfilled. And whosoever, therefore, shall break one of the least commandments and teach men to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever shall keep them and teach them so, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For verily, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, in no way shall you enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus Christ peace be upon him said that if you people want to enter heaven, you have to keep each and every commandment of Prophet Moses, peace be upon him. You have to follow each and every law given in the Old Testament, including the verses I quoted earlier, that there is one God and you should not do idol worship. You should not make any graven image of him. Jesus, peace be upon him. He never said that he was God. In fact, he said that he was sent by God. He was a prophet of God mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 24. The words that you hear are not mine, but it my Father's who has sent me. Gospel of John, chapter number 17, verse number 3. This is eternal life, so that you may know there is one true God and Jesus Christ who thou hast sent. And it's mentioned, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 19, verse number 16 and 17, that when one of the persons approaches Jesus peace be upon him and says, Good Master, what good things shall I do that I shall attain eternal life? Jesus peace be upon him replies in verse number 17 of Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 19, and Jesus said unto him, Why thou callest me good? 
for there is none good except one that is God and if you want to enter life keep the commandments Jesus peace be upon him never said that if you want to go to heaven you consider me as almighty God he never said that you believe that I will die for your sin in fact he said you keep the commandments it's further mentioned in the book of Acts chapter number 2 verse number 22 O men of Israel, hear this, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved by God amongst you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in your presence and you are witness. It says, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved by God by miracles and wonders which God did by him. And when Jesus, peace be upon him, was asked, that which is the first of the commandments? He repeated verbatim what was said earlier by Moses, peace be upon him. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 12, verse number 29. He said, Shama Israelo, Adana Elahaino Adna Echad. It's the Hebrew quotation, which means, Yoro Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. So if you read the Bible, you will understand the concept of God in Christianity. It reminds me of an incident where Maulana Rahmatullah Karanvi, he was having a discussion with a Christian missionary who was trying to prove to Maulana Sahib that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is God Almighty. And that Jesus, peace be upon him, died for the sins of human beings. After a great deal of time, without any result, the discussion was continued. Later on, the servant of Maulana Sahib, he comes and whispers something in Maulana's ears. The Maulana's face becomes sad. He starts crying. The Christian missionary asks, Maulana Sahib, what's the bad news? The Maulana Sahib said, in a very sad tone. My servant, he just gave me information. He brought news that Archangel Gabriel, he died. The Christian missionary began to laugh loudly. Maulana Sahib, you being such an intelligent person, how can you believe in such absurd things? Can angels die? The Maulana Sahib said, when God can die, why can't angels die? <laughs> and the Christian missionary, without speaking a single word, he left. It's a battle of wit. Let's discuss the concept of Almighty God in Islam. The best answer that anyone can give you regarding the concept of Almighty God in Islam is quote to you, the Surah of the Holy Quran, Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4, which says, Qul huwallahu ahad. Say he is Allah one and only. Allah hu samad. Allah the absolute and eternal. As samad is a bit difficult to translate. It means that he exists and he has created things when nothing existed. Everything and every person is dependent on him, but he is not dependent on any person or anything. As-Samad, the absolute and eternal. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. Walam yakullahu kufu an ad. There is nothing like him. This is a four-line definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the touchstone of theology. Surah Ikhlas is the touchstone of theology. Theo in Greek means God. Logi means study. Theology means study of God. Surah Ikhlas is the touchstone of theology. If anyone wants to purchase or sell any of the gold jewelries, first they'll evaluate their gold jewelry. And for that, they will go to a goldsmith. And the goldsmith, he takes your gold jewelry and he rubs it against a touchstone. 
and he compares the color with samples of gold which he has rubbed at the site and then tells you whether it's 24 karat gold, whether it's 22 karat gold or whether it is not gold at all. It may be fake gold because all that glitters is not gold. Pura Ikhlas is the touchstone of theology. It's a four-line definition. If you apply to any candidate who says that is Almighty God, and if he fits in this definition, the Muslims have got no objection in accepting that candidate as Almighty God. It's a touchstone. It's the asset test to decipher whether the person that anyone claims, whether he is Almighty God or not. It's the asset test. It's the touchstone. Four line definition. Call who Allah who Ahad. Say he is Allah one and only. Allah who Samad. Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam yalid walam yulad. He begets not, nor is begotten. Walam yakul lahu kufu an Ahad. There is nothing like him. It's a four line definition. Anyone claiming to be Almighty God, if that candidate fits in this four line definition, we Muslims have got no objection in accepting that candidate as Almighty God. For example, some people say that Bhagwan Rajnish, Osho Rajnish, he is Almighty God. I would like to make it very clear. I said some people say Bhagwan Rajnish is God. Not Hindus say Bhagwan Rajnish is God. Because once, during question answer time, there was a Hindu gentleman who came and told me that we Hindus don't believe in Bhagwan Rajnish as God. I have read the Hindu scriptures. I know that the Hindu scriptures don't call Bhagawan Rajnish as God. I said some people call him God and Rajnish have got followers from various different religions. Let's put him to test of the touchstone of theology, Surah Ikhlas. The first is, Qal hu Allahu Ahad. Say he is Allah one and only. Is Rajnish one and only? We know that we have several such fake godmen especially in our country, India. He is not one and only. But there may be some people who are disciples of Rajnish and say, no, no, Rajnish is one and only. Okay, let's go to the second test. Allah Samad. Allah, the absolute and eternal. Is Rajnish absolute and eternal? We know from his biography that he was suffering from diabetes, from asthma, from chronic backache and he alleged that the American government they gave him slow poisoning imagine God being poisoned the third test is lam yalid walam yulad he begets not nor is begotten we know that Rajnish had parents he had a mother and father he was born in Jabalpur in Madhya Pradesh in India but he was a very intelligent person later on his parents became his own disciples. And in the year 1981, Rajnish, he goes to America. And in Oregon, he establishes his own town and calls it Rajnishpuram. He took America for a ride. Later on, the American government, they arrested him and put him in jail. And later on, kicked him out of the country. In 1985, when he was kicked out from America, he comes back to India and in Pune, he starts Rajnish Neo Sanyas Commune, which later on he called it as Osho Commune. And when you go to Pune in the Osho Commune, it's mentioned on his tombstone Osho, never born, never died, but visited the earth from the 11th of December 1931 to the 19th of January 1990. They forgot to mention that he was not given visas to 21 different countries. Imagine Almighty God visiting the earth and he requires visas. <laughs> and the Archbishop of Greece said that if you don't deport Rajnish, we will burn his house and the house of his disciples. And the last step, walam yakullahu kufu an ahad, it is so stringent, it's impossible for anyone besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the true almighty God to pass. It says there's nothing like him. The moment you can imagine 
the moment you can draw a mental picture, what God is, he is not God.